Hi, Jenny. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Frank. Hey, Jenny. How you doing? All right. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this because uh, I get to escape from curriculum work for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I'm, I'm in the middle of scheduling calls to um, colleges to follow up on the work they've doing, been doing in Guided Pathways. So I'm escaping from calendar uh, purgatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's intense stuff right there. I, I it is there's not very many things I would not rather do than that. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, the talking to the colleges is awesome, but the like every you know every email has to have a sign up genius and a Zoom link, and you know I'm so like like trying to make sure everything does just so that we get it all done. So yeah. um, Go ahead. let's let's check this and make sure. Can you? 
share your screen. Yeah, let me do that right now. So I'm going to share my desktop. And so there you go. Okay, so no problem. So you're going to run the slides for Lisa. Yeah, I think so. Um, I'll, yeah, is that how she did it last time? Do you remember well, if she had Lisa, uh, Susan do she that? She had Susan do it, but we had a disaster where she somehow, when she logged in, got she was logged in twice and then I removed one of her and then she got kicked out of the meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I can do that. No worries. I have at this point, I have the, I have her PowerPoint. So let me go ahead and display that for her now. Okay. And that way when people start to log in, they will see her. So let me just kind of fix this a second. Let me slideshow. But in actuality, I'm going to show, I have one that I'm going to, I have a few slides that I'm going to show first. Okay. No problem. So I'm going to share mine, but we will watch for Lisa to um, log in. I'll be, yeah, I have it open and ready to share. As soon as, as soon as you're done with your curse, I will you're, jump in and share. Okay. And then you'll, you can share to the end um, after, once we do once I transition over to you, but I'll stay the host because otherwise we have found that the recording messes up. So. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Share your screen. It's not a problem. Okay. And then, yeah. So you can stay host. You might need to make me co-host so that I can manage. Um, oh, the, I'm going to have rooms. to make you the host to be the breakout rooms. That's the trouble. Yes. When I make you the host, will you make me the co-host? Oh, definitely. Or you can just make me co-host if you like, because you're already host. So I think it should let you hover over me and let you make me a co-host. I can do that, but I but you won't be able to do the breakout rooms. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Then let's do it that way. If you make me host, I'll turn around and give, make you co-host. Okay. So when the, when the time comes, I'll make you host. You make me the co-host right away. Also, my colleague, Katie Giardello. Well, I'll make her a co-host, and she'll probably stay a co-host when I make you the co-host. Okay. Sounds so, good. It's, it's so confusing. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, zoom, zoom, zoom. zoom, um, zoom it's intense. Yes. Yeah. All um, right. So I'm going to leave my um, screen up and I have a, a sandwich I'm trying to finish here. So I don't want to chew at you. No um, problem, Jenny. I totally okay. understand. All right. Have a nice lunch. I'll see you in a little while. Okay.
Hi, Shauna. Welcome. We'll get started in a little while. Um, we're just waiting for the other participants to arrive. Okie dokie. I'm extra early, so I won't be late. Awesome. You're just like me. I'm the same exact way. I love that. Thank you for being here today. No problem. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Jenny, how are you? All right. I only see one of you. That's good news. It is. <laughs> Even though, you know, it was twice as nice, but <laughs> hopefully we won't have the same issues. I, if I'm going to go to that much trouble, I do want two of me and one person can deal with <laughs> harder stuff. And I'll That's <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, I could use two of me to one person could continue with uh, scheduling meetings with colleges while the other one fully participates in the workshop. So <laughs> there you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, I just like totally coincidentally, a friend of mine from Kalamazoo wrote me this morning. Yeah, mm. um, she's working in the K-12 state. Uh, so she's part of the regional directors for my STEM. Ah, okay. And she said, I need to get caught up on what the data center is doing. And I was like, funny, you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so anyway, I said, well, I'm working with Michigan faculty today. So anyway. Fun stuff. It is. Um, yeah, I've had these long connections to uh, various folks in Michigan and I'm thrilled to be part of this and get to know all of you all. So. Yeah, and people really responded well to the first workshop, so. Good, this one's really gonna be workshoppy, like people are working. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, um, cause I think last week we had, we had some groundwork to lay, but today mm -hmm. we'll really capitalize on the fruits of that. Um, oh, great. To, to collaborate in a, in a deeper way for longer periods of time. So very cool. It'd be fun. And, uh, and you met uh, uh, my superhero friend, Frank. Yeah, in actuality, I know Frank from another project. I figured that you had, I mentioned it last time. He's like, oh yeah, I know Jenny. Yeah, we were reconnecting actually, so that's nice. That is yeah, Jenny's great to work with, Lisa. I mean, it, she makes things easy. She's easy to collaborate with. I, I worked on the Pat the Calc. Um, I, did, I did a Calc, Pat the Calc presentation in Michigan, which I really yeah, enjoyed. Yeah, that was fun. Great sessions. Mm hmm yep. And folks are arriving. This is good. Grab a glass of water. Shauna, I love your background. So fun. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Makes me happy. I meant to mention it last week, but um, we were a little bit too close to time before I noticed it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, that, um, is that a Bitmoji classroom or is that something you created uh, separately yourself or what? Where, how'd you do that? <laughs> I use the same guidelines for creating a Bitmoji classroom, but you can just save it as an image and then use it as a background on any platform. So yeah, oh, <laughs> so, it's yep. so it's the Bitmojis. <laughs> well, and that plus your uh, your framing there, or I guess it's your chair or something is also yep. super amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's another, it's a virtual throne. <laughs> In my virtual classroom with my little virtual me helpers. <laughs> yeah. 
My sister I wish were real. <laughs> say that last thing again. I wish those were real helpers. <laughs> I know, right? To carry things around, it would be great. Yeah. <laughs> My sister teaches first grade, and she was one of those folks who made like a bitmoji class picture, like they hadn't had their class picture yet as first graders, you know, where they're all lined up on the risers. And she, I don't know, people were doing that. I had no idea. And I was like, how long did that take? Right. <laughs> Because she made a separate one, right, for each. Then you got to line them all up, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, uh, skill, <laughs> or time, or I don't know what, yeah. <laughs> some combination of both, but, you know, they're first graders. I'm sure they were, like, head over heels over it. <laughs> yeah, I think the kids liked it, and then some parents were like, wait, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I think it was a, it was mostly good but not all the way like some family members thought it was a little weird <laughs> so oh yeah so but um it definitely the the intention was to create something that was otherwise impossible so right i think it's cool mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know my uh, big kids, what I call them, my students love my little classroom. So, and a few of them will send me their little pictures of their little bit emoji. So, <laughs> yeah. Last semester when I was teaching at ACC, or not last year, but last, last school year, mm -hmm. um, I had, somebody had to do some kind of class presentation and they were too nervous to do it in person. So they used their Bitmoji self and it made it into some kind of an animation. Yeah. Um, like one of my, uh, the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. One of my coworkers was showing me her students. She had them do um, a video presentation and she was showing me that, but neither one of us can figure out how to do it. But I thought that was so super cool because she required that you uh, had an image. And so she used her Bitmoji image and made a video. <laughs> yeah, it was it was astonishingly high quality. Like I was just like, you know, I I think uh, somebody looked it up and told me, you know, it's not that hard to do, but it just looked really fancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's cool though. Mm -hmm. Well, and we need things like that when we are remote that are you know interesting and also like inspire us in some way. Right, but I like I like the way that the students can use their little creativity mm -hmm. to uh, still meet the the assignment standards, but you know, and have a personal touch, but still, you know, they they can still be in their comfort zone. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. We got more folks arriving. Chelsea, welcome. Erica, good to see you again too. Katie. Hi there. Hello. Hey, Katie. Again, joined by the sleeping dog over my left shoulder. You know, I love how he's always so perfectly placed. Here. He's very consistent in that regard. He's 15, so this is what he spends most of his time doing. <laughs> or barking at me, one or the other. Mm -hmm. He's kind of become a cranky old man. Well, they do, don't they? Mm -hmm. Our dog is 16, and last week we had, I don't know, one thing after another. We were certain that she was on her way out and we just kept checking to make sure she was still alive yep <laughs> then we went to the vet and got some medicine and now she's just as ordinary as ever so yeah yeah <laughs> we had a similar incident his hips are really going and then he started on a new supplement and it was like he was a puppy again <laughs> it was the arthritis medicine we finally realized that, that brought her back <laughs> mm -hmm. Although he's been on it for a while now, and I don't know that it's worn off. I mean, I think it's probably still helping, but it's not as, he's not as vibrant as he was when he first started. <laughs> but we do frequently say, okay, just make sure he's still breathing. 
<laughs> go, go check it out. <laughs> Some other folks joining. Welcome, Calvin. Welcome, Sean. Uh, Frank, are you able to make the breakout rooms? Room, sorry, breakout rooms as co-host. Uh, in. Yeah, as soon as I become co-host, I'll be able to make the breakout. Okay. I think I I'm gonna make Frank the host so he can be he can do the breakout rooms because I think only the host can make breakout rooms. That's what we were thinking. Okay. Right. Yeah, we just but, wanted to hear why we he, And he's going to make me a co-host as soon as I make him the host. Okay, great. But also I have Katie and Erica as co-hosts also. So if, Oh. If, All right. I, I have a lot, and I've made you a co-host too, Lisa. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm giving away a lot of power in this meeting. I think you should just make everyone in the meeting a co-host. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Let's see what happens. It sounds I fun. I tell you what, I could use all the help I could get on this day. <laughs> I need help with virtual school. So if anybody wants to co-host with me, uh, virtual elementary school, that would be super. <laughs> what's the subject? Is it managing Zoom invitations and Outlook calendars? Um, what's really funny, because I spend so much time Zooming for work, is we had a problem. Nico was supposed, my youngest, was supposed to share his screen during a breakout session today, and we couldn't make the screen sharing work. And I was oh, no. like, I was like, no, this is like my nightmare on a loop. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll see what happens. Maybe tomorrow he'll be able to share. Right. We, we had to move his desk out of his bedroom today too. So today has not been the best day. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, and I will be in two places at once starting at three. So we'll see how I can like bifurcate my brain and. Sean, I don't recommend it. You could get kicked out and never come back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Watch out, yes. <laughs> we may never see you again. That's not good. You know, there are days I wish I could just disappear for a while and have no one find me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we don't have all of the people that we are expecting, mm -hmm. but it is 2.31. So I think I'll go ahead and start the part where I talk and I think people will continue to join. So I'll start my video and um, reduce my multitasking in front of my face here. Um, so, Good afternoon and welcome back to our participants from uh, last week. And if you're just joining us for the first time this week, you are in for a treat because I think you're going to really enjoy this session. We had a great time last week and we're going to have a good time again. Um, this is Culturally Responsive and Sustaining Teaching Practices Part 2. I'm Jenny Shanker from the Center for Student Success. I'm joined by a number of my fantastic colleagues on this call today. Um, er we have Erica Oriens and Katie Giardello with us. Um, I don't think Precious is with us, but she's an important part of our team, so we, I included her in the slide. Um, we have uh, a number of ways for you to participate today. One of them, we ask people to uh, rename them, themselves to include the name of your college or organization. That's helpful, particularly for our guest presenters who, who may not know all of you. Um, and to use the chat to ask questions or to unmute yourself. We're a fairly, I think we're gonna be a fairly manageable group size today. So, um, I think probably you will be able to just unmute yourselves. Um, and I'm just gonna say quickly, I, I um, had an experience today that reminded me that not everybody is constantly using chat on Zoom. So if you haven't, it's, if, if it's been a while or you haven't, don't forget that you just type your message down here in the little box and then hit, hit enter and then everyone will see what you chat. Um, we're also going to be um, talking about this meeting on Twitter, Katie, who is our tweeter in chief, um, will be leading that kind, kind of leading the charge on the Twitter conversation, adding um, uh, 
tweetable remarks and insights to our Twitter account. So join us on uh, Twitter to follow along with the meeting as well. And I bet that Katie has just dropped the Twitter address into the chat. Um, I just, and I'm just gonna talk just a couple minutes before I turn it over to our great presenters from the Dana Center um, about some things that are coming up. Um, most notably, we have some faculty events that are coming up this month. Um, we have a round table for My Start to Finish on October 20th, and that's um, kind of a, a faculty connection point for all of the faculty who are participating in My Start to Finish. Um, it'll be a general conversation. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the various areas of developmental education. Um, some thoughts, oh, Chelsea, your cat is beautiful. Um, <laughs> some thoughts about um, this, uh, this series. People, I'll ask people if you attend the round table and you were here par as part of this series, possibly to share some things that you um, are taking away from this series. And then close, even closer to the end of the month, we have a kind of a follow-up series, which is open to all faculty um, that will be similar to the roundtable discussions that we had this summer, um, following up on some of the themes that emerged from those discipline-specific uh, breakout groups. Um, we're gonna be focused on hands-on learning in a virtual world on October 26th. Um, creating Connected Communities on November 2nd, and Hacking the System for Ideas That Work the following Monday. These are at noon. Um, and these will, depending on the size of the group, we'll have some cross-disciplinary conversation and possibly some subject-specific breakout rooms. So if you want to reach out to your colleagues in um, your discipline and share information about that, um, we'd love to, to make those conversations as robust as possible. Looking forward to chatting with, with many of you. And then we have a few other events that are coming up even more quickly um, in our Autumn of Equity. One of them is today, and you've already registered for it, so welcome. Um, and then the second one is tomorrow we are having a webinar on some equity tools from our friends at the National Center for Inquiry and Improvement who have come up with a dozen or so different sort of conversation starters um, that can be used on your campus um, at very meetings at various levels. Some of them are specific to faculty and learning. Some of them are more specific to leadership. Some of them are a little bit more general um, in terms of transformational conversations. So um, if you have time tomorrow at noon and you want to register for that webinar, um, I encourage you to do so. And then finally, we will, and, and all of these things that I just mentioned um, are available on uh, the mcca.org events page. I'm gonna show that to you in just a second. But I wanted to mention um, our equity tweet chats coming up on October 29th and November 17th. Um, so we've been spending, you know, we've, we've been spending some significant time focused on issues of equity. We expect to continue to spend significant time focused on issues of equity in the upcoming months and years. Um, and so we're, we're really putting a lot of kind of equity conversation out there and thoughts and soliciting your insights. Um, please plan to join us for one or the other of those tweet chats if you follow us on Twitter. If you don't follow us on Twitter, make a profile and follow us on Twitter. We're fun. Um, just look at Katie. She is so fun. Um, and to, in order to join us for most of these events, you need to visit your friend, the mcca.org events page, where you can find these things to register. The tweet chats you don't need to register for. You just come to Twitter and we'll be there. So that was a lot of information to throw at you. Anybody have any questions for me right now before I get ready to turn it over to um, our friends from the data center. Okay. I'm not seeing anything. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce, I'm going to let Lisa and Frank introduce themselves. And while I am doing that, I am going to make Frank the host and so we'll all cross our fingers and then he's going to make me a co-host. 
All right, I'll introduce myself. I'm Lisa Brown. And as you know, I'm from the Charles A. Dana Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, my role there, for those of you who are just joining us this week and didn't get to um, hear our introductions last week, uh, my primary role is around um, developing and delivering professional learning, um, either webinars like this or a longer series of um, professional learning opportunities. I've been at the Dana Center for about 15 years, or a little over 15 years, actually. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, an adjunct at the local community college, although not teaching uh, there this semester because I'm in the middle of developing some series of professional learning. But anyway, it's great to, to see those of you who I met last week and welcome to our new folks. And I'll kick it over now to my colleague, uh, uh, Frank Savini. Hi everybody, my name is Frank Savina and I get to be behind the scenes today. Uh, I'm a course program specialist at the Dana Center uh, and what that means is I spend all of my time working on higher education math curriculum. Um, so if you kind of hold that for a second, I'm going to say the next thing and, and you'll realize why I'm saying what I'm saying. I am really happy to be with people today because I spent all of my time thinking about students, paper students in my head, you know, writing lessons and writing curriculum. So it's really cool to be with real life people even if it's virtual. So I'm glad to be here. Um, before coming to the Dana Center, I was a math instructor at El Paso Community College. Um, and before that, I was a high school teacher for many years. Um, so I love what I do at the Dana Center and the best part of this is being with other faculty members. So I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, thanks, Frank. All right, folks, uh, we'll get started. I'm gonna do a few reminders from last week. Um, and um, so our goals are the same, but we're going to take things deeper during today's session. And we'll have a lot more time for collaboration and sense making um, as we explore and discuss like what are these uh, practices going to look like in our classrooms or among one another as colleagues. Um, and what steps can we really take to incorporate what we're learning um, in ways that support equitable teaching and learning going forward. Uh, these are the same norms that we had last week. And I'd like to do the same thing that I did last week, which was um, peruse the list and think about one norm that you want to focus on today. And again, as last week, uh, drop that in the chat. So identify one of those and drop that in the chat. All right, thanks folks for your contributions. Sean, focusing on systems. Katie, systems not people, solutions not blame. Chelsea, thank you, solutions not blame. Well, it's popular today. Diane, thank you. Are the rest of y'all feeling shy? Thank you, Michael. Solutions not blame. All right. That's great. I want to give um, also a couple of reminders for those who are just joining us and were not able to be um, part of the work last week. But uh, one of the things that we did was we all created a Google slide to introduce ourselves. I'm not asking you to do that right now, but I just want you to know about those slides. And if you want to contribute a slide after today's session, please feel free to do that. Um, also, uh, we have um, the handouts from last week. Um, those are still available. So we have links to both of those there. Um, and um, we'll be referring to those a bit. So let me capture those two links and I'm gonna drop them in there just in case. And again, we don't, you don't need to work on that slide, but you may want to access those handouts from last week. 
All right. One of the things that we used as a um, sort of a touchstone for our conversation last week were the principles of equity mindedness that come from the Center for Urban Education. And as you, you could see from the image, um, those principles are um, represented as gears because of the interconnected nature of each of those principles. So to put a little more context to that, when we're talking about race consciousness, we're talking about it in an affirmative sense. When we're talking about systemically aware, we're systemically aware as educators of the overall sociopolitical context of education in the United States. Um, uh, another aspect of that is our, our focus on gathering evidence, questioning assumptions, disaggregating data in particular, um, and that we take an institutional lens and focus in the work that we're doing. We view inequities um, as equity-minded practitioners. We're going to view those things as problems of practice, problems that we can put ourselves to task um, in order to address. And the final gear is advancing equity. And by that principle, um, the Center for Urban Education means that we're action oriented. And the actions that we take um, are uh, specified here. I have highlighted three of them in a different color because I think that they are most relevant for our conversation today. But you can see here there are seven of the sort of actions that equity minded practitioners take according to the Center for Urban Education. So a couple of other reminders from last week. We were working th through um, um, some materials that were published by Alicia Chavez and Susan Longerbeam. Uh, this is, I've read several books on culturally responsive teaching and learning and lots and lots and lots of articles, but this resource has been to me the most powerful that I've come across. So I'm excited to have an opportunity um, whenever I can to, to share a bit about um, this particular resource. So we talked about frameworks from this particular book and we also talked about the elements of culture and we did some reflecting ourselves on culture or our own culture um, during the session last time, but also I asked you to, to think about these things a little bit in between sessions understanding that not everyone has uh, the, had the time to do that, but we've structured the session in a way today that we think is approachable regardless of whether or not you were able to join us last week. Because we'll be working in groups and, and um, you'll be there with folks who, who were uh, part of the work last week. So one of the things we, uh, that I introduced last week was the notion of um, cultural frameworks that sit on a continuum. So last week we talked about on one end of the continuum would be um, frameworks that the authors described as an individuated framework. Um, and you can see there the description of that, an individuated framework as uh, more private or compartmentalized, linear, and so on. And we talked about that being a continuum toward the other framework, which is a culturally integrated framework. And you see those descriptions there as more interconnected, mutual, reflective and cyclical, contextually dependent, and so on. And what we did last week was we looked at that through seven different sort of categories of teaching and learning. So for each of those categories of teaching and learning, like what do we feel as faculty the purpose of learning might be? Or what do we feel as, as faculty is the role of time in learning or the role of the teacher or um, the importance of student interactions or what those student interactions look like? And so I asked all of you who were here last week to think about each of those eight continua and place yourself somewhere on that continuum. So in my example here, I put that um, for purpose of learning, I'm a little bit more on the um, individuated side in terms of the way that I value um, the purpose of learning. So in that case, I'm a little bit more on the side of individual competence and move forward toward goals or the betterment of humanity. That's kind of where my background comes from. But I have to say the first time I did this, I was further 
to the right than I, or further to that side than I am now. So anyway, uh, we all went through that process uh, last week and placed ourselves on there. And then I um, uh, offered some exercises for you all to consider in between our time together. So this was the follow-up and preparation activities that we put forward last time. And um, I hope that everyone had a chance to do at least some of this work. Um, I really wanted you to think a little bit more about like, where are you on each of those continuum? And um, think about your own sort of distinctive values and priorities to help you think about how, you know, how it is that you're placed on there. Where does that come from? If we think back about those concentric circles around culture, those often come deeper inside when we're talking about our values, come deeper inside of our, um, our identity. So, um, so one of the things that we wanted you all to think about is given that each of us placed ourselves somewhere on each of those eight continua, um, if we think about a student that might be coming to us from a framework that's different from ours, um, what might that experience be for them? Uh, and then the other, um, thing that I put forward, which I highly recommend, although it is quite time consuming to complete the whole process. Frank and I went through this uh, in the last year, uh, spent a lot of time going through the whole teaching autobiography. But what we had suggested was at least spend a few minutes just thinking about your own cultural identity. And the document there kind of walks you through that process. So um, even just thinking about it for 30 or 45 minutes, I think is very valuable for today's conversation. But we know we do not want these preparation activities to have been a barrier for anyone. So we design this in such a way that if you haven't done these things, um, you'll still have sort of a jumping on place for the work we're doing together. All right. So if we come back to those eight continua, uh, what we want you to do is consider those frameworks and that handout, the, the one that I put in the chat, it says bit.ly CRT-1 handout. So you can see all of the frameworks in that handout. So we want you to do this. Consider those frameworks. Think about a time when a student didn't meet your expectations and which of the frameworks might be relevant to that experience. And then we're going to come back to this sort of underlying question of how might a student with a different cultural framework than you hold today um, experience your courses in contrast to a student who may be experiencing your course, course who has a, a framework that's more similar to yours. So take about three minutes to do some individual reflection on this and then we're going to place you in breakout rooms and give you a chance to share.
got one more minute. Okay, uh, Frank, how are you doing on breakouts? We're ready to go. We're going to have uh, four groups, uh, two groups of three and two groups of two. Um, so if you just say the word, I'll send them the breakout rooms. All right, folks, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. And Frank, do you have that set up for like they'll come back automatic or they'll get a little 60 second countdown timer? Yeah, I'll, I'll send them the 60 second timer in about nine minutes. Okay, so when you get that timer, yeah, you do not have to rush back. You've got a whole extra minute. Okay, thanks. Have fun, everybody. All right. Okay, I think, yeah, everybody's in their group, Lisa. So I was um, feverishly looking at our lists while you were, um, you know, talking and stuff. We were, did we pause the recording? Oh, let me pause that real quick. You know what, you, it's okay, we'll cut it out. Oh, that's okay. I forget we have um, plush service over here. Yeah, this is yeah, nice. Yeah, plush service. Yes, yes. Okay, so I'll let it roll. Uh, so, um, yeah, Lisa, just an FYI here, we have, uh, a total of 11, I'm sorry, 10 participants right now, I believe. Okay. Uh, let me just double check that. 10, 10 people are, are there. Of the 10, three have selected the breakout they wanted. So I'm going to make sure that they're in the, in the same group. Okay. Uh, and then the other seven, I'll just place because they didn't choose or they're, I, they're, they're not on the list. They're, they're new. So yeah. just an FYI, a lot of these were not on the list. So I'm assuming they're new. Yeah, we were anticipating that. So that's perfect, Frank. I actually think that's better because it, it was hard to to put them all in their preferences anyway. So Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I'll I'll just make there's three of them. I'll make sure uh Chelsea, Sean, and Katie go where they belong. That way they get to kind of focus on the group. Hi Cheryl, we lost you for just a little bit. Let me assign you to we're in groups right now. So um if you'll take a moment to look at the, uh, the instructions for the breakout. Uh, and while you do that, uh, if you'll let me know when you're ready, I can put you in a breakout group. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to give you a link to the handouts, though, because you might need them during the breakout. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. There you go. And thank Cheryl, when... When ready, you can go to group, just press accept and you'll go to group three, okay? Thank you so much. Glad to have you back. Okay, so Cheryl's in her group. Okay, and then Frank, um, let's see, what time was it when we sent them or what time is, let's see, it's one fifty. We sent them at 1256, my time, one fifty six yours. So I will call them back at, 105 mine okay that'll give them a one minute warning so okay. sweet we are right where i hoped we would be are really close awesome so
You feeling good, partner? I feel like I'm the like I'm I'm working the ring, right? Like I'm on the corner and I'm doing the spraying you with water, you know, like the the boxers and oh, you know yeah. that. <laughs> I've been watching Rocky too much. Oh, your dog or the movie? No, the movie, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, That's my funny, dog's man. name is yeah. <laughs> my dog's name is Rocky, by the way. Hi, precious. Oh, cool. Precious is here. Yeah, welcome, Precious. We're, we've got folks in breakout rooms, so Frank is going to okay. assign you a room. Okay, or great. No, you're, you're part of the uh, my STEM. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. It took me a second to clue in. I was like, wait, this name's familiar. <laughs> That's okay. Um, please excuse my tardiness. I had a few things going on today. Uh, so did I. I totally oh, couldn't go on a few things. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Precious, so Precious, should I go ahead? Is it okay if I, we have, we still have about six minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and assign you to a, a, a breakout. Well, if you wanna be part of a breakout, Precious is part of Jenny's team. Oh, got it. Yeah, it's up to you, Precious. Uh, I'll hang out with here with you guys if that's okay. All good, yeah. Okay. This is the cool group, by the way. So yes. yes. <laughs> the best group by far. <laughs> <laughs> How was the session then? Say again? How has the session been? Well, we um, so far fine. Um, we don't know though because we we did some orienting from last week and Kate because we had a few people who were new. Sure. And so we wanted to give you know a little bit of background for those folks, and then we sent them to breakouts, and we also you know shared what the upcoming events are and things like that. So um, lovely. So we you didn't miss a whole lot that you would not have already known. So okay. Yeah. But, Wonderful. Uh, I want to introduce you though to my colleague Frank, um, who's our tech facilitator, but he and I work really closely together at the Data Center. So we're super excited um, to just be part part of this together today. So nice right. to meet you, Precious. Nice to meet you too, Frank. I um, have the pleasure of working with Jenny, um, my partner um, with Jenny and doing the my best work. So building economic stability today and supporting um, the colleges and the economic stability work that they're doing on their campuses. That sounds pretty exciting, actually. That sounds it like a really, really is. <laughs> it is exciting. It is exciting. I was, I was reflecting on last week's comment that Frank, you may have heard this in your previous work in Michigan, is that in the rural areas, the economic inequality is um, um, especially uh, challenging in, across the state of Michigan. So it was one of the things that came up last week in the conversations. Yeah. Um, their communities just look a little different um, in, in, in the rural areas. And so, um, especially with like technology and transportation, um, and then just being able to have access to um, community-based organizations is um, just a little different in their areas. So it's really nice to be able to offer our colleges um, a structured way to ensure that their students have access to the things that they need to be successful in their, in their coursework. Mm -hmm. And I actually was on a call with um, Trellis Research, which is part of um, my tardiness today. So they're going to be administering a survey in a couple of weeks that helps us better understand what the students the students are experiencing um, and, and so that we can better ser su service and support them. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're excited to get the data from that survey. And after the survey administration, colleges will actually have the opportunity to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call to go over their data to understand exactly what the results mean for their students, as well as what they can do with the information that they receive. That sounds great. Yes. I do think, you know, it, it's so often that folks look at data, but when you have someone with a finer lens toward that data to help with the processing is huge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. All right, Frank, let's see. We're, we're at about one more minute before I send the call back, Lisa, so. Okay. 
what we're having folks do right now, Precious, is think about a time when a student they were working with, oh, you can see it on the slide there, um, to consider yeah. where there may be a disconnect between the cultural frameworks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Frank, can you remind them to have a reporter? Yeah, let me send that message right now. Just one to two themes. Okay, I just broadcast the message. I'm gonna wait about two seconds and call them back. Sweet. Okay. Sounds good. And 60 seconds, Lisa. All right. So for Jenny and Precious, I have this other curiosity about connections between higher ed and K-12 across the state because I, I probably also spent many years in the K-12 space and one of my Michigan colleagues uh, from Kalamazoo wrote me today and said, hey, what's the Dana Center doing in Michigan? And I was like, well, thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> so she's the Michigan STEM regional director uh, for Michigan STEM or my STEM. Who is it? Mm -hmm. Lisa? Uh, Diane Owens? No, I guess I don't know her. Uh, I will, um, I should connect you all though. Yeah, I, I, for, I used to be involved with the MyStem partnerships mm -hmm. um, uh, several years ago and it just, um, their focus was very, um, you know, on the high school work and I, I, I was pulled in many directions. So I was part of that group for a while, but I don't, I think Diane was there when I was there. And we're, we're back, Lisa. Great. All right. Welcome back, folks. Um, we are curious to hear uh, the perspectives from each of the groups. And we'd like for reporters to summarize uh, one theme from the conversation, or two, one to two themes from the conversation. And Frank, if you don't mind noting those in the um, chat for us, that would be helpful. Uh, which group would like to go first? I can take the plunge. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so for our group, um, we um, basically had a, a, a little bit of a difficulty trying to determine what culture even is, and that we felt like there's a lot of uh, different things that kind of feeds into culture. Um, one thing that we talked about um, was maturity versus culture and how that ties in um, into the um, actions and expectations that we have versus our students. Um, and so that was one thing that we talked about since we have to pick one. It was mostly about what is culture and how maturity kind of plays into that. <clears throat> Can you give an example? Of yes. Yeah. Um, we talked about kind of like the culture of education and how um, when we were undergrads, um, how we were more about ourselves. But when you go into like graduate school, um, you're like seeking out partners, groups, they, they form more collaboratively. And is that more off of culture or off our maturity of figuring out that, you know, things go a little bit easier if you have a group of people working together versus you trying to figure it out on your own. So we weren't so sure if that was more cultural or even the educational cultural system, or is that more off of maturity that you've learned this behavior over time that this is what's best for you. So that's where we're kind of, we were kind of like trying to figure 
figure these division lines out as to what is culture. And Chelsea, um, she said a, a term that kind of stuck with me, like, you know, I don't have these anchor points, so I have a hard time of figuring out what culture is for me is what she had stated. I hope I'm quoting her correctly. But um, yeah, so sometimes, you know, some people have these anchor points. She used the example of like her neighborhood or her um, race or, and she listed quite a few other things she said, but she didn't have that one defining moment or anchoring moment. So it's hard to kind of figure out what culture is. Um, so, so yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, that's it. Uh, one thing that came to mind as you were talking about um, the, the issue of do we work more in, uh, in individuals or whose responsibility is it? Is mm -hmm. it individual responsibility for learning um, or is it more of a collective or integrated Mm -hmm. um, approach to learning and I think I think the point that you raised I would be curious if other people would relate to that that as an undergrad we may have had the perspective or the framework um, if you if you want to use that word for it that we needed to be individually responsible for ourselves as undergrads and then when we got into graduate school I know for, for me, in many cases, we were required to work together. So the, the, the framework that the instructors had in graduate school was a mismatch at first mm. for those of us when we went into graduate school. So I'm curious if people can unmute and comment on that, but that's sort of what came, came to my mind. And I don't know if that really is getting at what you were sharing though. Mm -hmm. I think it is because then isn't your instructor kind of framing your culture as it, on your campus or or however you were delivered your graduate education like you know um, now in my degree program we weren't first forced to work in groups it's just that it was just so much easier for us to work in groups but I do know that different programs um, have that requirement like I know um, what MBAs and like engineering you got to do a lot of group work but in math like you know you, you can work as individuals your professors didn't they didn't really make us but the groups just formed because like one person would get one part and one would get another Chelsea has her hand up and she was in my group let's let her talk <laughs> Actually, it was something that you said, Sean, it made me think about how the, the relationship, I, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but um, the relationships I had with my instructors as a new college student versus a graduate student were very different. And when I, mm -hmm. when I started college at the community college where I teach now, you know, I was like, you're, you're sort of programmed almost in the same way that you are toward your parents to be like, like not totally trusting them or you just want to like give you the information and leave you alone kind of thing. Like just give that like your perception of the role of the teacher is different. Mm -hmm. And that comes up on that, on the, um, on the, the framework thing to the role of the teacher and who's kind of in charge of providing that education. And I think that shifts mm -hmm. a lot from, from your early experiences in college where you want to like show up, sit down and have the teacher give you information um, versus being in grad school or even toward the you know end of an undergrad program where you begin to develop relationships with, with your instructors mm -hmm. where you can kind of see information and knowledge and meaning traveling across the board there and I think that's where that maturity piece came in too because part of becoming mature as a college <laughs> student was realizing that my teachers had more to offer me than just an information dump and it makes me wonder how at how how do we get that message across earlier in someone's college education um and what like what does that look like mm -hmm. and yeah. i do like who is the responsible for putting that message out is it individual instructors or institutionally is the system thinking about um who's responsible for learning or what the role is of the teacher or the mm -hmm. role of the student and so on all right thank you i'm going to call that group one uh, so what's a, do we have some perspectives from the next group? I guess I can go next. Um, you know, it's interesting that the question of how do you define culture came up in your guys' group. Um, but uh, we, uh, Katie, Giardello and I were in the group together. And so uh, we kind of said, well, I 
have teaching experience. I'm actually teaching a class now, but I'm an administrator in my day job. Um, and of course, Katie's with MCCA. Um, and we talked about how this same concept is just as applicable at an institutional level or even comparing college to college. Uh, like I have some of my friends uh, from OCC where I used to work and now I've been at Glen Oaks for two and a half years. And there is a very big difference in terms of what the faculty and the administration, for example, thinks about um, what's, re you know, what's required of whom or whose job is it to make sure that curriculum changes get made and so forth. Or I think at OCC, we had a very, very um, active, proactive uh, group of uh, committees that were related to the faculty senate. Uh, and, uh, you know, not every committee was, you know, <laughs> equally active. Um, but I think there was a real sense that um, kind of everybody has ownership of these programs. Uh, whereas um, at Glen Oaks, sometimes what I've, what I've seen is that there had been more of a reliance on administrators to say, hey, we need to get this done. And so it's kind of the same or analogous to that responsibility for whose responsibility is it to learn? Well, whose responsibility is it to make sure these things happen at our college? Um, or whose responsibility is it to make sure, you know, we stay up with best practices and so forth. And so we can look at cultural frameworks at an institutional level as well. Now, the other half of our discussion was maybe more in line with what um, the, the question prompt was. Um, and for, to, 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 to tell you that I have to out myself, I'm originally from Russia. And I came to the US as an international student about 20 years ago and went to a community college. And um, so uh, I have a firsthand experience of kind of sitting there and comparing. And I had had a year of college in Russia before I came here. So to have that opportunity to compare, how does it work? I understand higher ed, but how does it work here? And what are the differences? What's being expected of me? For example, it's expected of me to select my own like elective courses where they just told you what time you had to show up for class when I was at Mendeleev. Here's your, you're in group B. Here is your schedule. Be there, you know. Um, and that's just a small way. Uh, but for example, things that in my teaching career and that part of my career that have come up, um, are questions of who's responsible for learning and what is my role as the instructor and what is the student's role. And depending on, you know, a student's family background or, you know, ethnic cultural background, national background, and myself being another example of that when I was a student, that there might be different expectations that students bring to that and being able to clarify them and being able to help students fit into the culture of this institution that you're teaching at, the culture of the class that you're trying to foster as, as a small learning community, uh, that's a really important thing. And I know we're all pressed for time. Uh, I'm a chemist by training. Um, I generally don't have a lot of time to spare to, to do side things in my lecture, um, but um, the importance of whether it's outside of class time or in lab or whatever the case may be for me to teach students how my class works, what are the expectations, and also to learn about theirs. And I, and I, and I think that's kind of, the, the, that's why I started with the other, because I think the, uh, at an institutional level, all of us kind of feel it. And we've been to a few different institutions as both students or colleagues, and we get it. But I think sometimes I know, speaking for myself, sometimes I can tend to forget that students have that experience too. And maybe not everybody's, you know, kind of with me as far as what I'm trying to do. So being mindful of that 
is very, very important. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, except that Michael was so nice because I always say I've never been a faculty member. I don't, I don't teach people. And he reminds me that a lot of the training and instruction that I do in my job is is still teaching. But I Absolutely. also, I really resonated with what the, the group before us said because that idea of maturity and cognitive mastery is very different. So what I told Michael is I have the chance to work with people who are a little further along in some of those cognitive mm -hmm. areas. And particularly when it comes to issues of equity, typically people right. are equity conscious. And so it makes the instruction that I do just a little bit easier. Um, so I have a lot of respect mm -hmm. for, for those of you that are in the classroom at, with those students at varying levels of maturity and cognitive mastery, because I think that um, we're talking about some difficult things as regards to whose responsibility is it and how do we um, make sure that's part of the academic culture mm -hmm. inside your classroom, but also at large in your universities and colleges mm -hmm. as well. Exactly. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think we had three or four groups with Let's hear from one of the other groups. I'll share for our group. Um, my internet is a little unstable, so if I get robotic, I apologize. Um, so I was in a group with Sean and Cheryl, and our group discussed responsibility to learn. Um, and the discussion started with Sean sharing that he had many students reluctant to attend draft conferences with him for their writing. Um, they didn't seem to want a face-to-face -face feedback. They really just wanted um, written feedback and not, not to really have to meet with him. Um, and Cheryl and I were coming at it from the administrative student learning assessment standpoint. And we noted that in our experiences, um, students of color in our institutions or uh, ESL students seem to perform, perform poor on assessments, um, measures of grammar and mechanics and that um, perhaps consideration should be given that there are cultural differences in speaking and writing um, and that that's not necessarily wrong. Um, and Cheryl talked very eloquently about differences in how we use words now from how we used them you know, long ago. And so we were kind of proposing that perhaps students' reluctance to meet face-to-face -face is fear of rejection or fear of that they're doing something wrong and not wanting to be face to face with the instructor to have those conversations that may be based in cultural differences in language and writing. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of a, the conversation evolved to really be about how grammar, mechanics, language is not, there's not always a right or wrong. And Cheryl had proposed maybe we need to relax some of those elements or use them in context specific ways. Um, so that was our conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think too, like there's so many reasons why a student might not want to meet with the instructor one on one. Um, and um, so that that can be a, a big barrier. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, let's hear from the last group. I think that's my group. Um, I think it's my camera. Sorry, I didn't have my camera. I was running back and forth and trying to take care of some other things. Uh, my neighbor's cat killed a rabbit on my porch, so I was trying to. Oh man! <laughs> it was a bloody Sorry, mess. So. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. And I was expecting a delivery, so you know, you try to get that off the porch. It's not um, what you wanted delivered, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. 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 You know, I, I appreciate that he likes us and you know leaves us press. That just wasn't one that we wanted today. But anyway, our group did something slightly different, but it reminds me of uh, something Rachel and Michael just shared. Um, and we were, you know, starting from that uh, issue of just cultural frameworks in general, and we talked about how. Um, and I think what's critical, and we, we call it been hitting at this a bit, is um, when you're talking about the, the role of the teacher and you have those cultural differences, it's about um, listening. And we, we talked about a couple of ways to uh, get to, for our students to get to know our cultural perspectives and for us to get to, to know theirs. And I think that that's critical sometimes when you're working with students because you need to tweak. And, and you kind of like need to kind of look through their lens and that, that allows you um, to change your practices, I think sometimes. So we just really, we just share different um, experiences we've had of how to do that, mm -hmm. how to get to learn that part about our students, some exercises. Um, and I just started it, I, I learned this when I was doing my dissertation many, many years ago. And we, 
we used to do an exercise and I said we bought crayons and it was called fixed positions. And I would kind of start with mine, you know, my, my picture and what got me to where I am to have the cultural perspective that I have. And so that shit, students could also share theirs. And, it, and once you've built that relationship, I think that it does make it easier to have things like um, one-on-one conferences because you're not standing from the position as my cultural perspective or my cultural framework is the only one that exists. You're going, okay, yours is as valuable as mine. Um, let, let's find that place of overlap so that we can have those productive conversations and that learning can take place. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, that's critical. And so, sometimes the conferences, we can schedule them, but they won't come to them. So then you have to accidentally run into them in the Student Life Center or something, but somehow, you know, open the door for the possibility of a relationship in the classroom or out in the hallway. It's a, it's a challenge, but yeah. that's, and, that's and the starting place, though, for so much of what you all are sharing right here in this part of our time together. You know, Lisa, if I could just add to what you said. Mm -hmm having worked at a four-year residential mm -hmm. university and now three community colleges, all three in Michigan, um, there is definitely an even higher barrier for us to surmount at the community college in terms of that, you know, creating that sense of community. You know, community is our middle name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kim's smiling because that was our motto when I was at OCC, but, um, but yeah, at the same time, it's kind of a community of passers-by in many ways. Uh, commuter campuses, you know, uh, while there are folks that really get involved and engaged and they, you know, they're in athletics or they work on campus or whatever, you know, however they, you know, they're in student clubs. Um, but it is a challenge because I, I did, uh, when I worked at a four-year school, I used to run into my students at the cafeteria and, and other places. And not that I didn't, um, you know, when I uh, taught at uh, KCC uh, here in Battle Creek. Uh, but, um, uh, but it is a, a, a different um, setting and a different way that students think of it, I think. Um, so being intentional at cultivating those connections I think is incredibly important if we have any hope of beginning to understand students from other cultures and we you know how we can help them better to learn and again not just to learn the subject but also to learn how to navigate our environment that uh, they're in and we're pretty expert at that as colleagues at our institutions, because we get to know, you know, who does what and who do you go to with this problem or that problem, but students don't, it doesn't necessarily always transfer. So taking the time with them um, to talk to them or ask them questions, um, get them comfortable with you, I think is critical. So thank you for sharing that, Kim. Mm -hmm. oh, Rachel's on the call, who's also from OCC. I know that we're looking at ensuring or, or we're starting to explore creating that sense of belonging for students so that if they do have a different cultural framework that they will mm -hmm. you know um yes they could come from russia Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still going to embrace them is, is that you know it, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your perspective is is that you belong here and if we give them that sense of belonging then hopefully you know, we can and bridge those gaps because learning mm -hmm. happens emotionally um, before it happens cognitively. And if we fail at that emotional moment, then I think we're, we, we could do better. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kim. And I owe you uh, 150 data center points because you have the perfect segue to my next topic. <laughs> I don't know what those 150 points will be good for, but. Um, I'll take them. We'll figure it out. Yeah. So I did want to talk a little bit about neuroscience for just a minute, right? Um, and so um, if we think about the importance of like where learning happens, right? It happens when we're engaging in cognition, right? When we're using 
this part of our brain, the neocortex part of our brain, that's where language development happens, our sensory <laughs> perception, facial, facial recognition, uh, complex thinking and problem solving, all of that has to happen here. But it can't happen here if it doesn't go through the two big gatekeepers in our brains, right? So um, before all that information, whatever the information is, can get up there to that neocortex, it has to get through these gatekeepers. So one of them is referred to in this image as our reptilian brain. Some people call it the lizard brain. All beings have this um, and its primary function of that sort of part of our brain is to keep us alive through automatic systems that regulate our breathing and heart rate, body temperature. Um, it, the, that system is scanning for threats. And what it does is it sends all that information um, to the amygdala. And the, the amygdala is sitting in the middle of our, uh, what, what some scientists call the mammalian part of the brain. And that's part of what makes mammals unique is that we have the ability um, to, uh, for emotion and feelings. So, um, and that amygdala acts as a sort of a, a switching station or uh, one of my favorite researchers that does a lot on kosher response and she calls it the guard dog. Uh, and the amygdala decides what information is gonna get passed up to the neocortex. The challenge of that is that under duress or when we're in an unfamiliar situation, that amygdala can act on its own if it believes that um, we're in imminent danger. Um, and it can do that by releasing uh, chemicals into the body that prepare the body to flee, fight, freeze, or appease. And when that happens, the information does not get up. It doesn't have a chance to get up to the cognitive part of our brains for us to process things. So in some circumstances, that amygdala can take over that communication system and hijack cognition altogether. And in that case, it can shut down learning. And so when we think about the, when there is a serious cultural mismatch that may be part of what is happening when students are opting out. Is there something about that that is a th feeling of a threat to the student? So the idea here with the frameworks is that by balancing these cultural frameworks, um, it's possible it could be more likely that that amygdala doesn't shut down that executive function. Over time, students are gonna notice that we're varying our teaching strategies in order to, we, to reach a wider range of people's cultural frameworks that they're bringing into our classrooms. So the book talks about this as sort of a both and, and I'll give you a chance to read this quote. So we're going to use this both and approach to apply what we've learned in our short time together. And uh, we're going to do so in, um, in this way. We're going to be placing you all in breakout groups for a pretty good length of time. Um, and what we want you to do is you're going to be looking at uh, one of the um, researched, you're going to be looking at one of those frameworks. So we're going to place you into four groups as we did earlier, but maybe slightly different configurations. Um, and each of you is going to look at one of the first four frameworks with at least a partner or a couple of other people. You definitely want a, someone to keep track of the time and someone to be a reporter. What you're going to do is I've provided you with some research based recommendations that come directly from teaching across cultural strengths. So last time we had the seven continua. For each of those seven continua are a whole set of research-based recommendations, starting places for faculty. Okay. 
okay? So you're gonna look at those recommendations. Um, you're also gonna be, I also put in there a couple of quotes. I think it's important to hear from one another. And by that, I mean hear from students and hear from other faculty who are on a similar journey of trying to be more culturally sustaining and responsive. What I want you all to do is look through, you know, read over those quotes, read over those recommendations, discuss them. And then I want you to think about what action might you take based on those recommendations. So what we're going to be sharing with you is a document that has this information in it. And I'm going to stop sharing my slides so that I can show you what you'll be working in. She says that. Where is it? Here we go. Okay. Let me move a couple of things out of the way. Okay. Are you all able to see a Google Doc? Not yet, Lisa. Not yet. Good to know. I told Frank, I said, my worst offense is always that I don't know whether or not I'm sharing. Okay. How about that? You're set. Okay. So in this document, you'll see all of the uh, eight continua. You're going to be assigned a group with one of them to think about. So for example, we've been talking about the role of the teacher, so I'm gonna to navigate to that one. If you click on it, you'll get the bookmark. It'll take you directly to that point into the document. And you can see here, I've got two um, uh, quotes up top, one from an Indian American nutrition student and one from an African computer science student. Then I have all of the research-based recommendations from the authors of the book. And then look here, I've left at least four spaces for you all to add your own ideas about action that you would take or in particular techniques that you would be trying out um, with your students or with your colleagues. You all with me on that? So you'll be reading those quotes to get a better understanding of what students and faculty are thinking and then these are their research-based techniques and what you're going to do is identify for yourselves specific actions that you want to take individually or collectively and we'll have you report on those um, when you come back so frank i think let's do 20 minutes instead of 30 because we're running a little bit further behind than we had thought we would be at this point. Sounds good. So I'm going to do 20 minutes uh, starting at 137, my time. Yeah. Katie, yeah. I got your. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just saying we had a rich, that's a rich conversation. And it's put us a little bit behind, but I think we can make those adjustments here. Sounds good. Katie, I got your message. Thank you. I will now send you to groups. We have um, some groups of three and some groups of two. Okay, before we go, though, I want to make sure are there any questions, Frank? Does anyone have any questions about the task? Also, there's a help button <laughs> in the breakout room. And you may see me pop in there, and I don't mean to be overbearing. I'm only just, like, listening in. Um, but if you do want help, I'll yeah, just call me directly, and Frank will scoot me over to your group. Any questions before we go? Alrighty. Okay, we'll here, here we go. Okay. Thoughts? Great conversation. Pardon? Great conversation. Wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I think it's especially after the maybe the second or the third group. Uh, yeah. Um, any concerns or adjustments you think we need to make? You all know your colleagues better than we. I think it's going well, and I think this is a really good group. What's on my mind is how can we, yeah. you know, do it again and yeah. get, get more people, people involved. Mm -hmm. I agree. I keep hey, everybody. thinking about that. Sorry to interrupt you. Lisa, you're getting a request for help from groups one and groups two. Okay. Uh, so let me assign you. You want to take them one at a time, Lisa? I'll assign you to group two. I'm going to go in backwards. I'm going to go group two, then group one, okay? All so right. Let me, let me assign you. Here it goes. Okay, thanks. Jenny, I'm with you. Um, and I think this goes to what you and I were talking about yesterday, where we have access to so many equity tools, and it's all coming at us, and you and I haven't even been able to handle it. Yep. And kind of discern what what's what. I can't imagine how our colleagues at the colleges mm -hmm. are or aren't even aware of some of it. Yeah. So I think that's going to be a task for us to, to consider how do we actionize, actionize, I may, may, may have that's just made that up. Out. Yep. <laughs> actionize uh, some of the, some of these resources, including everything that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have some ideas that we could talk about. I think we're scheduled to meet tomorrow. Thursday. Um, Thursday. Man, I don't ever know what day of the week it is. Literally, I never know what day of the week it is, except for like Saturday or Sunday when I get the break, although sometimes mm -hmm. I don't get the break. Um, I, I had this experience <clears throat> kind of funny, I'll say quickly before they be, people come back. I, I noticed as I was frantically working on all of the things that I was working on that Cheryl, who's at this meeting this afternoon, was entering the meeting, the webinar for tomorrow, and then leaving, you know, because Zoom tells you she's in your meeting. Here's your recording. She's, you know, and then and and then and then I was like, well, she figured it out, right? But and then she did it again, and then she did it the third <laughs> time. And I was like, and finally, and I was just about to email her, and she finally emailed me and said, I don't know what's wrong. I'm in your meeting, and it's not started. I said, because it's tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because we just had no idea. We um, don't have any idea what day it is. Yeah, what day it is? Yeah. yeah, literally no idea. Okay. So um, anyway, so. Yeah, I I feel like though when we meet on Thursday, then um, we we can talk about that. Like, how do we? I almost feel like we could create a course shell in Canvas. Um, I'm wondering if that's a possibility because we need a way to sort of curate yes all of these opportunities and make them asynchronously available. Because I think yeah. many people's issue is they can't show up at the time, and then. Mm -hmm. But there also has to be a hook because otherwise they're just going to sign up and not do it. So I yeah. have some ideas. Okay. Hey, yeah. hey, welcome back, Lisa. So I, I jumped into group two real quick or group one. You were in group two. They were having issues with the link. So I'm looking at the link right now for breakouts two and three, which is the bit.ly CRT.HE, but they're having trouble accessing it. Let me, should I try dropping it in each group? You want me to go into each group and just drop that in their chat? I dropped the whole thing into... Uh, something to everyone. I hope they got it. Yeah, and that's what one thing that wasn't clear is which framework they were working on. So what yeah. I did say to them was that their group number is right. So uh, yeah, so do you want you do you want to go to you want me to go to some of the groups and give them the you want to put the link in the chat right now or copy and paste that in and go into each group? Is that what you want me? That might help. Well, them. I mean, everyone should have it. So did you go to see group one? Yeah, but I couldn't give it to them. Is it, I just wanted to confirm it. So is it the CRT one or do you want to give me the link real quick? The link is right there in the chat. Got it. Let me just get my chat in order. From Lisa. Is it at the top, Lisa? It's not in the chat? Uh, the handouts, is that the one? Because there's three no, of them. No, I want them to go to this. CRT webinar series table. Hmm. So is it this one? I, I can't see you. I'm going to put it in your private ones. Just in the, that one, right? Yeah, they can get it from there. That's a folder. All right, let me go in there and make sure they have them. I'll be right back, y'all. OK.
What's nice about a Google Doc is you can see whether or not people are in it. That is true. Yeah, so we only have two people who are in the Google Doc. Hmm. Now, when Frank gets back, we may have to just pull everybody back. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you put the link in the chat? I don't feel like I saw it. I know. Yeah. I don't, you, you were in group two? Did they, they were rolling when you talked to them, or did they need a link as well? No, they're fine. Okay, let me go to group three. Okay, Frank, maybe yep. we need to pull people back. Like, okay, now we have four people. Because I was like, we don't even have four people in the document, but now we do. So, do you want me to pull them back? Uh, no, I think we've got two groups working. Let's, bo let's don't bother them. So okay. why don't you send me over to um, three or four? Okay I'll, okay, I'll send you to three. Do you want me to go to four? That way we catch them at the same time? I don't know if you, if you can do that. Yep, I'll do that. Let me send you first. So Lisa, I will move you to group three. I'm sending you to group three. Okay. Put the link. link. Put the link to the Google Doc. Is this it? Okay, thank you, Katie. Yep. Actually, let's post, the... let's post it right on the... Um, Re registration site, so we make sure we have it. Post on the link. This document. Yeah, on mcca.org. No, I don't want this this document to the whole general public, though. Oh, okay. Because it's mind. about people's ideas and the permission to do what we did with this is still pending. So. Gotcha. Okay. So. Um, it is on your slide, though, Lisa. That is on our website. Sorry, what? It, it The link is on your slide, which is posted to our website. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, but not the direct link. Got it. Yeah, gotcha. I just did not use this direct link. Since it's, sure. Yeah. I won't tweet it then either. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, Frank, you're sending me to three? I think he just sent himself. Yeah, Frank's gone. I think he went to three, maybe. All right, that's fine. And I sent the chat, the link in the chat, but I don't think it went to everyone. I think it's just to us. It's only to us, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but at least you and I can see it, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least we had that that link to the folder on the slide. People could get that. So. So Jenny. Uh, one of the things we can talk about is whether we create our own equity challenge using these resources. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it too. It just sounds like more work for me. <laughs> I liked the idea of a plug and play of somebody else's equity challenge. However, this yeah. will be, this will be curated to our audience and mm -hmm. it would in a way force people who want to go along with us to really check out these tremendous resources that we will be I think that's uh, a, actually through. a great idea. We probably will have mm -hmm. 21 uh, <laughs> oh. resources. Well, and we should do some of the, like I, I sent you some links to some equity challenges, the originating one from mm -hmm. somewhere in New England, and then the Michigan League did one that I felt like was fairly well contextualized. Um, and I still would want to do some of those early level Mm -hmm. topics and issues to get people yeah. warmed up and then we could even create see I'm just so complicating we could create <laughs> strands for the work too where if people if if it was a more pedagogically focused person we could send them to resources related to pedagogy uh or and you can do that a, with canvas okay I'm seeing I'm, I'm thinking this that we're not going to try to do this next month um, no, I'm thinking 21. I, I think we launch it as a, we, we do some kind of New Year's resolution thing where we mm -hmm. challenge our network to be more equity conscious. And we don't have to come up with a whole lot of new programming. You and right. I can parse out the programming we're doing now that may or may not get as much visibility mm -hmm. um, because people are just so busy and get more visibility for these things, but also 
hopefully pour more, pull more people in. And if we can curate it, I hate Canvas, but if that's our only tool, then that's our only tool. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, it's, I think it's yeah. our best bet right now. It's not yeah. ideal, but we're not going to yeah. get our, I mean, any learning management system that we tried to use would not be better. So yeah. the other thing would be to create a website that would be kind of expensive. Yeah. So. Well, let's let's noodle on that, and we can talk about it on Thursday. Er and Erica has joined the chat. <laughs> I know Erica's like, you're gonna do I what now? Spending she's money. Like, she's like, you're, you're <laughs> gonna do what now? <laughs> what what new project are you doing over there, you rogue women? <laughs> you you can imagine my shock face at Katie <laughs> suggesting a new project to do. <laughs> I'm gonna develop a new course. For right. Us. <laughs> let's. Uh, Let's not um, do that and say we did. I, I was just going to mention, for some reason, I thought I saw something about the free Canvas thing had changed. So, oh. Yeah. So okay. I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay. But I, I could be wrong. It could have been another. Well, I'm thinking element, about. But also, uh, um, the website thing, you know, I mean, certainly talk to Digital Active because it's not expensive. Well, we could do a website, we could do a Google Drive, and there are ways to do this interactively through Google. I certainly want to wrap Twitter into it. Um, but, you know, the more I talk about it, the bigger the project gets. Yeah. <laughs> Again, shocked face. I know. She's just shocked. She yeah. keeps me employed. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, but like if maybe you missed this, Dr. Oriens, where I said we wouldn't necessarily need to come up with the content because we want to, and I don't want to use the word recycle, but we would like to push the content we're experiencing now, both through this series, but also through the other equity programs that we have coming up a little further out and get more visibility. So we wouldn't be coming up with the content. We just need to come up with the framework. Yeah, it's more like the communications piece of it. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, and how I to make it. Certainly you know, the, the, the amount of content that's out there that's not well curated yeah. is, especially in the virtual world, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's something that we are beginning to see, you know, we had this conversation yesterday, I think yesterday morning, um, you know, it's becoming, part of the issue is becoming less about getting access yeah. and more about how you can communicate that information in a way that's meaningful for people yep. because the content is everywhere and it's almost always free and available. Um, you know, we've sort of entered the, um, you know, the OER of access to resources where, yeah. you know, it's not really about it's not really about getting access to it, you know, or having the resources to travel and attend an event and that kind of thing. It's more about how can we be strategic about what we share. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, well, and, and kind of, I mean, mm -hmm. in really offering people the opportunity to maybe, I like the idea of the, the equity challenge and, and we would tie it to guided pathways and give the idea of people creating their own plan of what they are going to learn and how they are going to use the resources. And that will allow them to customize it to, you know, if they're a faculty member or if they're an administrator or if they're something else, mm -hmm. what, how do you make your own personal, Im personal slash professional improvement plan mm -hmm. based around the equity resources that, we have been providing and and i don't think we should need to i think we should try to do it without collecting more than we already have correct except yeah. except i do think we need to do some of that level setting in the beginning but that the stuff that the michigan league put out that i sent you that link to i think is really good and it's contextualized mm -hmm. at least in michigan so um that could be helpful sure yeah yeah because i do think we need to do a little bit of that early learning together to, mm -hmm. to be sure there's a shared understanding of what we're going to cover. But I agree. I don't, I don't want to pull much more in. I want to help them see and feel how what we've already been exposed to is actionable for them. Or what did I say earlier? Actionized? Actionized. <laughs> yes. Frank, Frank, while you were gone, this group is solving all of the problems in the region. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah, right. And and I'm creating brand new projects for brand, myself brand, that brand new projects. 
but funding sources have not yet been identified. No. Fine. <laughs> fine. We're going to be fine. Fantastic. Oh, I'll be right back to you all. I'm going to go check on group one. One Wait, second. Frank, hang on. Hang on. Okay. Frank, how, how, yeah. uh, you, you talked to groups one, two, and three? I talked to all four. They're already rolling. Uh, but group one has another question. Let me see what group one has. I'll be right back. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> No, this is good. We we um we've been talking about equity for a while now, but we've had so much going on. We haven't had a chance to really talk about mm -hmm. what to do next or how to synthesize some of the content that we've been putting in front of people. So I think that this would be a nice opportunity. Um, I just well, even, even to just start with, let's organize what we've done and what we know about in terms of you know the known universe of what we what we have so far. And I think you're right, some level setting, but also like, you know, I, you know, this, the, the webinar tomorrow with the equity tools mm -hmm. from NCII, the, yep. that, that's so much stuff there. And so much I, stuff. I know that I people completely agree. That. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's my point. I'm sure there's some, you know, columnist at the Washington Post or somewhere, the New Yorker who will talk about this kind of, trend that we're seeing in terms of access to the content, you know, but it's, it's really more about what you do with it. And, you know, it can get overwhelming to, mm -hmm. to figure out what to do with it. Um, you know, and that's certainly when we've talked with presidents and, you know, about some of their priorities and that kind of thing, there's a ton of stuff out there. You can, you know, you can Google this, you can get tons of resources, yep. you know, yeah, we're, we're not the only place that's providing that to people, but where, you know, where can you, how can you offer something that is, you know, it, implement, you know, focuses more on implementation. Actionizable. <laughs> Actionizable. No, so I'm thinking about, and then, you know, if we use it, if we use our, the MCCA equity statement, though it is not perfect as an organizing mm -hmm. principle. Yeah then it might be that that might be helpful in kind of mm -hmm. pulling it all together mm -hmm. um because yeah. you know there's lots of places you can you know you could google how can i start my personal equity journey and get your own personal you know you like yep. you can get a lot of suggestions and things but but what we want to do is kind of figure out a way to lead people on a shared experience you're right yep. so that they yep. can they so that we're all understanding the same things <laughs> Yep. At least to the extent that that's possible. Yeah, I'll, then, I'll send you guys. I actually just today had a conversation with one of my colleagues who's, or former graduate, graduate student colleagues, mm -hmm. um, who's doing some of this work. So it, in very similar to what you're describing, Jenny, which is some of the non-event focused work Mm -hmm. and, and actually a little bit what Lisa had us do between last week and this week, which is reflecting on yeah. things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that sort of creates that kind of homework yeah. that people can do. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think that's a, in some ways what people are looking for. Yeah. Right. And then, I, and then just really from a very practical sense, you know, these recorded events need to live somewhere yep. where people can understand what they are and what, what you will learn if you watch them. Yep. And then how they can use them. To, yeah. Like, I like your idea, Jenny, of making, I, I think it would be probably inhibitive, uh, inhibitive, prohibitive, whatever. I'm just making You're up all the words today. All over the place I'm, today. It's fine. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, but I don't know that we can require them to do a real strategy document, but to help them see and understand how they can plug and play onto their own campuses to fit into whatever they're already doing yeah. or, or help them formulate a strategy if they haven't done that. My guess is they're already doing that in some respect and mm -hmm. they all have those, you know, diversity officers and so on. Some, some are and some are not. I mean, when, when can you listen to this. Just a second? Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, Frank. Hey there. Okay. What's Lisa. Yeah, so group one asked for a little bit of clarification. I gave it to them and to their assignment. Uh, we are at about one more minute before the 20 minutes is up. Uh, quick recommendation, I would say, maybe we give them five minutes. Um, so 
that's where they're at. That was group one. Groups two, three, and four, like I said, four is had to join the party a little bit late because they didn't have access to the to the the document for just a little while. And groups two and three got rolling a little bit later. So you might want to give them about four minutes or five minutes more, and that that might work. I haven't seen any other no no one has done what I hope they would do. Okay. So I'm inclined instead to just call to bring them back. back and ask them to go put their ideas in the in the document. Sounds good. I we are at yeah, we are at I'll think because I don't know what they're doing. Like there's no um there's no evidence of of their thinking. Like we need their we need their their collective stuff documented. Um even if it's emerging, right? Do you know what I mean, Frank? Yeah, so I would say, yeah, if you want to call them back and just offer some clarification and see what's going on, that might be more helpful because they're kind of disjointed right now. Well, I just, I, I, they might not be. They might be totally on the same page. But That's true. They just okay. need them to share it. So let's have, let's have everyone come back whenever the timer is up. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and call them back because we're at time, and that'll give them another minute. Okay, cool. Thanks. So let me close the breakout rooms. Okay, 60 seconds. All right. Yeah, I think that's the hardest part. Lisa says, once I'm the host, I can't, I can send myself to rooms, but I can't send you to a room once you've gone to one. I can't communicate with you oh. at all. <laughs> yeah. Like I was texting you, but I was like, I don't think he's probably looking at his phone. So. Yeah, sorry. I was all, I was just managing all the stuff. Sorry about that. No, it's, all, it's all good. I just, um, Right. That's right. The host can move around all they want to, but the, but, but once you've been sent somewhere, you have to like leave the meeting and come back in to be sent somewhere else, which you yep. don't want to do. Yep. Yeah. What happened last week? <laughs> well, and then I'm wondering, uh, Jenny, if maybe we should put you all in with them so that you can listen in. That, that is, that is probably true. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, it depends. Yeah. Your call. Yeah. And we are back. Hey, welcome back, folks. Hello. Hello. How are things going? Good. Say more. Good conversations. All right. And if we think about kind of where you are in the conversations, I was hoping you would read this student or faculty voices, take a look at the recommendations and start generating some of your own ideas. Where are y'all in your own ideas part? Chelsea supposed the report, but we, we have some things. You made me step outside of my box though. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know you well enough to know where the edge of your box is. So, um, <laughs> I think what I really want to do is check in with the groups. Frank and I are feeling, because he's come and popped into a couple of your rooms, is that you need some more time to document what it, what your ideas are. Is that a true statement or is, what's your feeling about that? I think Shauna and I are, are ready to share ours. I think we landed upon like two shareable things just as we were wrapping up. But if other groups need more time, we can certainly. Yeah. Um, we were able to come up with some ideas as well in our group. So we're ready to share out. And Michael had to leave, but he and I came up with some ideas before he left so I can share. Okay, so there's two ways we could do this we could share them out to the whole group like this or you could go back in the document and write your ideas in there in the blank spaces in whichever table you were working in we didn't have access to be able to edit the document so no. if you could give us access we could populate our answers there all right let me see if 
I can do that. I thought I did that last night, but you just never know. Okay. Um, maybe it would be better to share them out. Okay, who wants to go first? And then Frank, can you capture these in the chat? We'll do. Okay. Um, we can go first because I think we were group one. Um, okay. Shauna and I were looking at the purpose of learning and um, we had an example of a British American graduate student who was very career focused and everything else was considered like a distraction. So just career. Um, the other example was a Hawaiian undergraduate student who was very interested in how um, what she was learning at school might be relevant to her community. Um, and she talked about maybe being a voice um, in her community. Um, and so as Shauna and I were looking at the individuated techniques versus the integrated techniques, we found that, um, and Shauna and I are both at the same institution, but Shauna's in math and I'm in English. Um, but we found that because both of our classes um, or the classes we typically teach are really like doing focused, like here's how to write, here's how to do this math. Um, that we, we found ourselves pretty heavily on the integrated side of things. Um, so we kind of had to work backwards a little bit to figure out how to maybe appeal to students or engage students who might be on the individuated side. Um, and we came up with two specific things. Um, the first is that um, we, we each had examples of how um, we engage students in a research process that was kind of community oriented, but within that definition of community, um, a student can really pursue career related stuff. Um, so we talked about how it can be helpful to think about your career as a community um, and apply um, you know, strategies from an English class um, in terms of writing about a community or researching a community or um, how particular math formulas might apply in that particular field. Um, we use nursing as an example. Um, Shauna said that a lot of her students um, picked a, like when they need to apply something to a context, a lot of times they would pick something related to their career. So I think situating um, career goals alongside other interests or communities that people might be a part of um, is one way to get at both sides of um, the, the spectrum here. Um, the second thing that we um, talked about, um, and this is, this is more Shauna's thing, but I'm excited to think about how it might apply in my classes too, is that um, Shauna explained that in her assessments, there's often like a part one and a part two. And part one is all about solving the problem, like making sure you understand how to do the thing. Um, and then part two is to apply um, what you've learned in like a problem-based situation. And Shauna noticed that a lot of students seem to prefer part one where they just need to solve the problem like out of context. Um, they just wanna like do the work, do the activities, um, complete the tasks. But Shauna said she values the, the application part more where it's applied um, to a particular context and so um, she noticed that um, maybe some of her students were more comfortable with the first part, even though she liked the second part more. And so maybe both of them exist side by side and complement each other. We have one researcher here at the University of Texas at Austin that's an expert in uh, psychology and learning science factors. And one of his recommendations is um, when we're engaging with students in mathematics, to ask them to think about how that math could be applied in their community, rather than trying to say, oh, this is where that's used. It's kind of an interesting spin on when are we going to use this. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, let's hear from a, uh, another group. I wouldn't mind sharing. Great. So I was in group two um, and we talked about the ways of taking in 
a processing and processing knowledge. So we had a Korean American computer science student who felt that the professor was able to integrate um, a variety of senses into the curricula, allowing this student to feel more at home because um, exploring spirituality and all of their senses was um, more conducive to the learning that they were familiar with. We also had a Scandinavian American student who liked to immerse themselves in theory and philosophy and really appreciated their professor telling them what specific information was helpful um, and useful for them to specifically focus on. So the integrated techniques that we talked about regarded real world problem solving and giving students an opportunity to solve real world problems and integrate what they're learning to, from the classroom into a real world experience. Um, and so that goes back to um, the first um, Korean American student who had the opportunity to learn in nature. Um, for a lot of students, having this opportunity is helpful. Um, we talked about encouraging students to explore possibilities with no right or wrong answers. So really um, exploring and honoring the journey of learning instead of being destination focused. We also, we also um, discussed guiding students to be more autonomous learners, self-directed and gaining resources for themselves and not necessarily rushing to give them the answer. So yes, we want students to understand, um, but we don't wanna compromise the answer for the, for the journey of learning it on their own and then helping students to own their experience, own their, their learning experience, but offer flexibility in their learning. So every student is gonna come into the classroom with a different level of understanding. So it's helpful to meet each student where they are and offer flexibility within the syllabi. Um, for individual techniques, we talked about abstract issues. So working in pairs and, um, and um, emphasizing, asking those how, why, and what if questions. Um, and so what do you really need to achieve is a question that we would encourage students to ask themselves. Um, we talked about, um, des um, again, being destination focused versus journey focused with the integrated techniques. And then um, um, students making connections to real world experiences. So for the student who um, comes from a different ethnic background or whatever background they come from, what real world experiences can they make into the classroom setting? So what content can they um, drive similarities to or, or from? And then we also talked about a broad sweep of concepts versus deeper learning. Um, and so we talked about tailoring your experience to fill the knowledge gap that is, is what is going to be the cause of change. So if a student is learning a particular thing um, for an exam or just to um, fill that um, educational gap in their learning, fill that gap with the specific content instead of um, a lot of different concepts that are not necessarily going to fulfill that gap for them. Thank you, Precious. All right. Uh, so we've got um, the first group, the second group. Who wants to go next? Well, this is Cheryl, and Michael and I somehow also wound up with the group two vignette. Fantastic. Let's hear it. So, um, many of the, the things that Precious already talked about. Um, but we also talked about having these two students in your same classroom, the student who likes to experience, who likes to explore, who likes to become personally involved, and the student who is more detached and likes to approach things from a more theoretical and philosophical aspect. And you've got the two of them in your room. How do you help both of them to learn without alienating either one? And um, so we, we got down to the idea of uh, universal design for learning that you're really trying to incorporate aspects of multiple different approaches to teaching and learning within every lesson, within every assignment, so that you would combine some individual work, some group work, some paired work. Uh, within every class so that everyone would hit their strength that within an assignment you would try to give alternative ways of approaching that assignment. So even though everyone would reach the same outcome, they might approach it differently. One group person or group might want to do a video presentation, another a written presentation so that you could build within your overall instruction ways to address different people's needs and approaches to learning. 
outstanding. I love the combination of the universal design for learning plus the culturally responsive. Thank you, Cheryl. All right, other perspectives. That last comment made me think about something I learned in a uh, conference on Friday. Um, the instructor, and I forgot what she taught, I'm so sorry, but she offered um, a menu of assignments that you can approach the number of points you need to pass the class in a different way, but the student um, was able to choose which assignments they wanted to do. So more assignments than were necessary. So, um, you know, it's like a, a menu, a selection. I think that can cater to, to both types of students. Um, and so I, I had written it down. Um, it's actually right here in my notebook. I'm like, oh, next semester. That way I can like taper off some of the complaints. But yeah, it, it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> it made me, um, you know, the last group kind of made me, that's, that's what popped into my mind, like different types of assignments. But, you know, if you're more individualized or more integrated, if you have a choice, like you can kind of like, and even from group twos, right, uh, have more ownership as to how you're approaching your own education. So I thought that was a cool idea. So yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyone else? Our group um, was looking at number four in terms of the role of the educator, whose responsibility is it for the learning. <laughs> and uh, very interesting, uh, the two folks we were looking at in terms of the case studies, one of the individuals was very much do for self, wanted to basically study uh, by themselves, be by themselves, work by themselves, and they took it as this idea of, of, of preparing for the future where they're not going to have a team and they're going to have to work on their own. The second person in terms of the case study was very frustrated with the group work that was happening in the classroom because they said that the professor uh, constantly makes the group work into debates, into competition. And was talking about from a cultural perspective where competitions were not were looked down upon in terms of the culture. And so we somewhat talked about uh, the individual aspect of perhaps making it such that these people were not, these young, these folks were not gonna be forced into doing group work if it was not something that they wanted to essentially do. So for example, the one, uh, the, the first person even mentioned that when they find out that there's group, that there's group work, they intentionally don't take certain classes, which means that they could be missing some very wonderful opportunities to learn from some faculty, but the group work itself. And so we were arguing that maybe we should make it such that the group work does not have to always be a necessity. But again, as other groups have said, making other types of options. We talked about the use of discussion board as a means of essentially navigating and cutting back on some of the group, the group work. And then in terms of the integrated, we talked about the issue of the flip of the flip classroom. So rather than having a type of debate where we're, you know, two sides are at odds, but flipping the classroom where we're teaching the other, we're teaching to the class or one group A is teaching to group B, group B is teaching to group, to group C. And so we somewhat looked at that and again, trying to be conscious of the fact that although group work at times folks think that it's the greatest thing on the planet, um, I shared a personal experience in terms of um, my own uh, running away in a sense from working in groups because of the level of cross cultural violence that I experienced when I was in when I was in school, and so it was a lot safer for me. I felt better working by myself. I remember once uh, a, a prof told me said, "Well, you know, this is this is in." job. And I said, well, I would rather do the work of five people by myself than to have to work with the group. And so again, as a means of protecting folks from some of the violence that they may experience, um, we wanted to make sure that we had those options. Thank you. Crit critical points. Um, particularly, I like, I like the notion of the, the flip classroom, which I think you're saying offering that instead of open debate in real time. Yes. Yeah. Or even if there's a way for people to engage in debate anonymously, I don't know if this is possible, but that's what comes to mind is that, that as an instructor, you know that students participated, but maybe they used a pseudonym or something like that so that they could share the perspectives without them being personally identifiable to, to that individual. Although some people would take advantage of that, mm -hmm. um, which is always the 
you know, kind of the other, other, other side of that um, issue of that versus not knowing who somebody is. It's, they could go either way. Thank you, Calvin. Um, if I may, I'm sorry. Yes, when sir. You said the notion of uh, doing this anonymously, um, I, I think there's still some interesting problems when we think about anonymous and what that actually means mm -hmm. in terms of some of the stigmas that students may be already dealing with and trying to navigate in a sense. Whereas there are certain, so there's certain characteristics that we have and folks are going to still make certain assumptions that, well, Calvin said this, I know it had to have been him. And then what is the, then what could be possibly the negative feedback that comes in later on? And so even when we say anonymous, there's still going to be some stigmas that may prevent some folks from actively participating at that, at that particular level. Yeah, I share your concern. And so that's why I'm like, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. So there's other issues and then there's the stuff we haven't even thought of that, that could be problematic so it is a challenge well folks we have about 10 more minutes and um i uh, i want to be sure though that we've gotten all all of the ideas out are there any others that folks want to put forward because as we were sharing this may have also prompted some additional um perspectives or strategies okay all right um I don't feel like we have time to do, we were going to do a second breakout and look at the other four strategies. Do you want to throw a few minutes at that? How are y'all feeling about that? Everyone's tired. <laughs> yeah, what? I wonder if there's, is there's more can we do some more debriefing as a group because we're our group size is diminished a little bit too so yeah i think that would be fine as well like for yourself for you personally what are one or two things that you're taking away from this experience So what I think I'd like to do is I'm going to offer a few more suggestions to you all. And then I'm going to give time for some personal reflection. Um, and I'll give a few minutes for you all to do some writing and then share out those final thoughts. And then we'll close out our time together. How does that sound? Okay. All right. So let me share my screen again. And I'll offer some more of the suggestions from our colleagues who um, wrote this book. The first one is not necessarily their suggestion, but it's our suggestion, me and Frank, um, that uh, I think everyone would benefit it taping, taking a deeper dive into what this book has to offer. I have put forward only the tiniest fraction um, this book is, I've never seen a book that has more very specific examples, like those quotes give you a feel of the level of specificity there. But then from those quotes, the, the creators of these frameworks gathered up those common themes, and that's how those frameworks and those suggested sort of integrated versus um, individuated strategies that's where those came from so our strongest recommendation is you know if possible do a more in-depth study of of what that book has to offer um i personally uh frank and i've both benefited greatly from engaging in the sort of full spec spectrum of questions that are part of that teaching autobiography it caused me to actually have to go back and talk to my own mother a bit about our cultural background as like my mother's Swedish and my father's sort of a mixture of Northern European. And 
So it, it caused me to ask my mother a lot more information about our cultural background, which helped me kind of rethink a lot of the things that I had done when I was in the classroom, especially working with middle school students here in the Austin area. Um, if possible, if folks have a different sort of framework than you do, or they have a more balanced framework, go visit them. See if they wouldn't mind you stopping in on their classrooms. So there's a ton of um, benefit to being able to watch one another if you have the trust with this other faculty member. So that's another strong recommendation. Um, it might make sense now that we're not quite halfway through the semester, but as you're thinking about the spring semester, maybe you might want to adapt some of your syllabus to uh, have incorporated some of the notions around culturally responsive teaching and learning. Um, and then there are other recommendations really around maybe pick just one aspect of your course that you want to improve upon. And better yet, if more than one faculty member are teaching the same course, pair up on that and do some analysis on it and look for a greater sense of balance across those integrated and individuated culture frameworks. So those are the recommendations of the, of the um, authors. And then our last recommendation is that the Dana Center does have like a multi-part series on um, equity in higher education. So um, culturally responsive teaching and learning is just one part of it. So it's like a six part series. So those are our recommendations. And what I'd like you all to consider is just for your own purposes, you do not have to share this out, but if you want to, that'd be great as, as in our last final minutes, but um, reflect on the time that we've had together and think about what specific actions you're going to be taking as a result of today and last week's learning and who are you going to do it with? Um, and by when. So set a small goal for yourself for the upcoming weeks relative to the time we've had together. And then to the extent that people are willing to share them, we'll use our, but take a couple minutes to jot down a few ideas on actions that you're going to take. Oh, and ignore that thing about session three. Sorry. All right, about 30 more seconds, and then we'll share out if you're willing to share. Oh, 
All right. I just want to mention there are several references in your slide deck if you want to learn more about these topics. These are some of my favorite articles or um, uh, webinars, links to webinars. So who's uh, willing to, to share with us, like, what are you doing and with whom and by when? I want to just share quickly because um, while you all were in breakout rooms, uh, Katie and Erica and I were talking about some ideas for how we can help you and support you in using all of these fantastic resources and making them more available and more accessible to you. So that's, that's what's on my list of things to do. So I wanted to get a chance to, to get that out there and, and that I hope a lot of you will plan to come to the My Start to Finish Faculty Roundtable, where I hope we can actually build on some of this work. Thanks, Jenny. Got time for one more. Uh, I guess I can speak then. Um, I'm thinking that I'm very, very seriously, seriously integrated. And I think that I'm going to spend the next couple months for the winter kind of figuring out how I can offer maybe two versions of my uh, assessments, projects or whatever to be more supportive to someone who is more individuated. Um, I think that I'm just stuck in, in my, this is what I think is best in the long run, um, but it, it might not be best. So um, I'm just going to kind of like ponder over how I can make something equally as rigorous, but at the same time supporting um, somebody who's more individuated. Thanks, Shauna. And thanks to everyone else for your participation in this um, webinar series. Uh, please keep in touch. This is my contact information. And I certainly, certainly hope that our paths cross again um, in the future. So thank you again. And thanks to our, our hosts and uh, Jenny's crew. And um, I'll hang around for a little while afterwards if anyone wants to chat. And otherwise, y'all are free to go. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you for being here and taking us through this, this journey, and we will be in touch. Um, thank you all, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Frank. Hey, Lisa. You wanna, uh, this is still recording, so I'm gonna stop recording. Okay. Uh, let's see here, stop.